Good morning. This subcommittee will come to order. Uh, without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the committee at any time. Good morning and welcome to today's hearing on the impact of forced arbitration on the fundamental rights of hardworking Americans and our system of laws. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Very deep within fine print of everyday contracts, forced arbitration clauses block American consumers and workers from their day in court to hold corporations accountable for breaking the law before the dispute even arise. This private system does not have the same procedural safeguards of our justice system. It's not subject to oversight, has no judge or jury, and is not bound by laws passed by Congress or the states. And when forced arbitration is combined with non-disclosure agreements, it effectively silences the victims of rampant corporate misconduct. For example, according to a dis disturbing report by the Washington Post, hundreds of former female workers of Sterling Jewelers, the massive jewelry chain that owns K Jewelers and Jared, were, and I quote, routinely groped, demeaned, and urged to sexually cater to their bosses to stay employed, end quote. According to numerous sworn statements, male executives and supervisors at all levels of the company engaged in a widespread pattern of abuse, harassment, and discrimination. This misconduct included forcing women to perform sexual favors to receive better jobs or higher pay and retaliating against women who reported abuse within the company. One store manager wrote in her declaration that male executives, quote, prowled around like dogs that were let out of their cage and there was no one to protect the female managers from them, end quote. Although many of the women at Sterling Jewelers sought to hold the company accountable by banding together in a class action, Sterling covered up this abusive conduct for years by forcing its workers to waive their right to bring a lawsuit against the company in public courtrooms. These arbitration proceedings were conducted in private, the outcome was sealed, and any settlements with the company were bound by confidentiality clauses. Not only did this massive cover-up shield the company from public accountability, it also blocked other victims of assault and harassment from coming forward until some of the stories finally became public years later. And as Gretchen Carlson, one of our witnesses today, will testify, this is not an isolated incident. Far from it. Thousands of women across the country have suffered through similar pain and humiliation. They were isolated by predatory companies, they were silenced by forced arbitration clauses, and they were unable to hold wrongdoers accountable by having their day in court. This is just one example of many areas where people's legal rights have often been disarmed. Uh, they relate to veterans, to victims of civil rights violations, uh, to uh, service members, and many others. This is nothing short of a corporate takeover of our nation's system of laws, and the American people have had enough. The overwhelming majority of voters, including 83% of Democrats and 87% of Republicans, support ending forced arbitration. It's time to act. With that in mind, I thank our panel of distinguished witnesses for appearing at today's important hearing and very much look forward to your testimony. It is now my pleasure to yield the balance of my time to the distinguished gentleman from Georgia, the sponsor of the FAIR Act legislation with 200 co-sponsors that would prohibit the use of forced arbitration in consumer, worker, civil rights, and antitrust disputes. Mr. Johnson, you're recognized. Under pre-dispute arbitration clauses unenforceable in certain employment, consumer, and civil rights cases. I believed that when one party is vastly more powerful than another, it's just not fair or equitable to allow a bigger guy to slam the courthouse door shut and force the smaller guy into a private, for-profit dispute resolution process when the little guy gets treated wrongfully. Corporations and employers love forced arbitration because most of the time they win. Uh, they get to choose the arbitrator, the rule of law does not necessarily apply, and there is no right to appeal the decision. In arbitration, the deck is stacked against the person and in favor of corporate interests. The Federal Arbitration Act, the Federal Arbitration Act was meant to apply to businesses of equal bargaining positions, but today the U.S. Supreme Court is allowing corporations and employers to force consumers and workers to sign away their ability to file suit in court and have their cases decided by a jury of their peers or to join a class action lawsuit. This is unfair and it's wrong.
That's why Congress needs to pass the Forced Arbitration and Justice Repeal Act, which has 201 co-sponsors. As the horror stories about forced arbitration continue to affect millions, Americans are realizing how they're being tricked and they're starting to fight back. My bill would help restore the right to the courthouse for Americans everywhere and restore fairness to our justice system. I thank the uh, panelists for being here today, and with that, I yield back to this chairman. I thank the gentleman. It's now my pleasure to yield to the distinguished gentleman uh, from Wisconsin, the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Sensenbrenner, for his opening statement. You'll hear a different view from me. Eliminating arbitration achieves one thing. It enriches trial attorneys. It doesn't help claimants. In fact, research is clear on this. When comparing arbitration and litigation in employment cases, claimants win more often in arbitration. According to one study, when a case doesn't settle and goes the difference, plaintiffs win three times more often in arbitration. Not only are these claimants more successful, but the research also shows that they receive nearly double the monetary amounts in arbitration versus in court. Wiping out arbitration would not give employees a better deal. What is a good deal is providing Americans fair access to justice. <clears throat> Taking a case to trial is costly and a time-consuming endeavor. Arbitration, by contrast, allows cases to be resolved in a much more affordable and timely manner. As Justice Breyer explained in the 1995 Terminix versus Dobson decision, and I'm paraphrasing, if a consumer with small damages claim is only left with a court remedy, the costs and delays of which could eat up the value of an eventual small recovery. Limiting or fully eliminating uh, arbitration would have profound chilling effect on justice. For many claimants, the balance of whether their case is worth it, either for them or for an attorney, will often be tipped against them. Killing arbitration will also harm businesses. Increased litigation means increased business costs, which will inevitably be passed on to the consumer. Rather than amassing lawyers' fees, businesses are able to use the more affordable arbitration. We should not make it more expensive for businesses or claimants to resolve their disputes when they arise. Which brings me to my initial point. Eliminating arbitration only benefits the trial attorneys. So the question for my colleagues on the Democratic side of the dais, why pursue legislation that puts the interests of trial attorneys over American workers, consumers, and businesses? I fear I already know the answer to that question. A lot of the fear-mongering surrounding arbitration sounds like it was lifted from the talking points from the AAJ's annual fly-in. The AAJ, or American Association for Justice, is the nice-sounding name of the plaintiff's attorney's lobbying organization. It also happens to be a huge donor to Democratic candidates, contributing millions of dollars each cycle to their campaigns. So let's not seek out faults in a functioning system to boost the bottom line of trial lawyers. Instead, let's ensure that Americans are given the opportunity to resolve their dispute thus provide them with access to affordable, workable, and successful means to resolve their disputes, and ultimately, let's not deny them justice. I yield back. Thank you uh, to Ranking Member Sensenbrenner. Mr. Brandon. Chairman, point of order. What is your point of order? Well, my question is just, can we impute um, the policy positions that members of the committee take to campaign contributions? Because if so, I think I'd be doing it uh, a lot more frequently. I thought that's something that we don't do. Uh, it's an excellent point of what I'm sure Mr. Sensenbrenner didn't intend to communicate that in that way. And, and, and well, I, it, we're going to be hearing a lot more yeah. of that in our committee if that's, if that's permissible, but I'm just curious. Maybe we can have somebody research that. With a gentleman yield? An excellent, With I, think a gentleman it, yield? I, I think we, we don't need to engage in this call. I think we all this is an important issue with strongly held beliefs on both sides. And I agree with the chairman right. on this, as, as is when I was I think we should, all, everyone should last avoid year, imputing Alec motivations. from the gentleman from Georgia. All right, the chair now recognizes the distinguished chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding today's important hearing on forced arbitration. 
and I will call it forced arbitration. Nearly a century ago, Congress enacted the Federal Arbitration Act to allow merchants to resolve run-of-the-mill contract disputes in a system of private arbitration that would be legally enforceable. The system that Congress envisioned was to be used voluntarily and only between merchants of equal bargaining power. Thanks to a series of disastrous Supreme Court decisions, however, the system has been turned entirely on its head. Private arbitration has been transformed from a voluntary forum for companies to resolve commercial disputes into a legal nightmare for millions of consumers, employee, employees, and others who are forced into arbitration and are unable to enforce certain fundamental rights in court. Many companies used forced arbitration as a tool to protect themselves from consumers and workers who seek to hold them accountable for alleged wrongdoing. By burying a forced arbitration clause deep in the fine print of a take it or leave it consumer and employment contracts, companies can evade the court system where plaintiffs have far greater legal protections and hide behind a one-sided process that is tilted in their favor. For example, arbitration generally limits discovery, does not adhere to the rules of civil procedure, can prohibit class actions, and almost always does prohibit class actions, may have no right of appeal, and the proceedings, and often even the results, must stay secret. For millions of consumers and employees, the precondition, whether they know it or not, of obtaining a basic service of products, such as a bank account, or a cell phone, or a credit card, or even a job, is that they must agree to resolve any disputes in private arbitration. That means that their ability to enforce civil rights, consumer, labor, and antitrust laws are subject to the whims of a private arbitrator who is not required to provide plaintiffs any of the fundamental protections guaranteed in the courts, and whose further employment may depend on how good a reputation he has among the uh, commercial class as ruling in their favor. We have a bedrock principle in this country, and that is that all Americans deserve their day in court. We make a mockery of this principle, however, when we allow individuals to be stripped of this right and to be forced into private arbitration proceedings without the safeguards our judicial system affords. Yet that is where we find ourselves today. This problem began in earnest in the 1980s with a series of Supreme Court decisions that misapplied the clear legislative intent of Congress and dramatically expanded the ability of companies to limit the rights of consumers and workers through forced arbitration. In 1984, the court granted corporations the right to enforce arbitration clauses even when state law rendered them void. And strikingly, in 1985, the court allowed arbitration proceedings to be used not just to settle contracts, but also to interpret laws enacted by, enacted by Congress that implicate fundamental rights. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor criticized the Supreme Court's decision allowing arbitration clauses to preempt state law as a form of judicial revisionism that is, quote, unfaithful to congressional intent, unnecessary and inexplicable, close quote. Similarly, Professor Margaret Moses, a leading scholar in the field of commercial arbitration, has observed the court has step-by-step -step built a house of cards that has almost no resemblance to the structure envisioned by the original statute. Most recently, a conservative majority in the Supreme Court reached new heights in misreading what Congress intended. Last year, in a five to four decision in the Epic Systems case, the court held that employers can, for can combine forced arbitration clauses with class action bans to prevent workers from banding together to hold law-breaking employers accountable, despite clear authority for workers to bring their claims under the National Labor Relations Act. That is why yesterday I reintroduced the Restoring Justice for Workers Act, legislation that would end forced arbitration in employment contracts and protect workers' rights to pursue work-related claims in court. As Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg stated in her dissent in Epic Systems, a congressional correction is urgently in order. I strongly agree. That is why I also strongly support H.R. 1423, the Forced Arbitration and Justice Repeal Act, or FAIR Act, in one of the few times where the acronym fits, introduced by the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, which would prohibit forced arbitration in consumer employment, civil rights, and antitrust disputes. I applaud Congressman Johnson for his leadership on this legislation, and I look forward to working with him and other members who have introduced legislation addressing the crisis of forced arbitration to ensure that individuals can once again enforce the laws that Congress enacts. The widespread use of forced arbitration is a serious threat to our entire legal system and the basic tenets of our democracy.
For many companies, arbitration has become a get-out-of-jail-free card to circumvent the basic rights of consumers and workers. It is up to Congress to reverse this dangerous trend. And let me just add here, we used to have a, a concept in law, when I went to law school, they still taught it, called contracts of adhesion, mm -hmm. where a contract was unenforceable if one party had no choice in entering into it. All of these arbitration clauses, almost, are contracts of adhesion. You try, when you want to get a credit card, try crossing out the fine print, if you can find it without the magnifying glass, that, uh, that uh, says that you will settle all, all uh, disputes in arbitration. Cross it out, see if you get the credit card. See if you get the bank loan, see if you get the mortgage. You have no, see if you get the car loan. You have no choice. And when the gentleman from Wisconsin talks about uh, voluntary arbitration. If we're a voluntary and we're between equals, that's what Congress meant in 1925. But these are all contracts of adhesion. They are turning the federal courts into simply collection agencies for rich people and, and making them unavailable, and making state courts unavailable for most people for most of the kinds of disputes that they will get into. It is up to Congress to reverse this dangerous trend, and I look forward to hearing from our distinguished panel of witnesses about how best to address this important issue. I thank the chairman for holding today's hearing, and I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. Now I'm pleased to recognize the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Collins, for his opening statement. Thank you, uh, Chairman Cicilline and Ranking Member Senator Brenner, for holding this hearing. Uh, arbitration provides consumers a simpler, cheaper, faster path to justice than the judicial system does. This is what the evidence showed at the last time the Judiciary Committee performed oversight of the arbitration system during the 111th Congress. The evidence in favor of preserving access to arbitration has only increased since then. Companies are continuing to follow arbitration protocols that help to assure due process is given to claimants against them. A string of new Supreme Court decisions has demonstrated the court's confidence in arbitration system. And the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's 2015 study of arbitration highlighted problems consumers would face if they had no access to arbitration. This is the Consumer uh, Financial Protection Bureau's study, but instead had to rely on flawed judicial class actions. That is, not to say that the arbitration system is any means perfect, but the arbitration system is generally good and should be preserved. Bills have been introduced this term that would wipe out the use of arbitration in broad sectors of the economy. Rather than, make, that rather than wipe out arbitration altogether, we should be considering ways that make it better still. The Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Graham suggested just that in the Senate Judiciary Committee hearing on arbitration earlier this year. He also suggested that while we look at ways to improve arbitration, we should also look at ways to improve litigation. I'm encouraged by those suggestions. The worst result would be to wipe out Americans' access to arbitration while leaving them only with an unimproved judicial system. You can't leave both untended. They have to be looked at together, and simply a blanket solution, as we found in this committee many times, doesn't work. In fact, it creates more problems than it was worth. So I look forward to the uh, Witnesses here today, thanks for being here this morning. It's good to see you, and, uh, and thanks, Mr. Chairman, for having us here. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Collins. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's witnesses. Our first witness is Deepak Gupta, the founding principal of Gupta Wessler PLLC. Mr. Gupta focuses on a wide range of issues, including constitutional law, class actions, and consumers and workers' rights. He is a leading public interest attorney and advocate, has argued several cases before the Supreme Court, and has handled appeals before every federal circuit and seven state Supreme Courts. Mr. Gupta was senior counsel for litigation and enforcement strategy at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau before the CFPB. He spent seven years at Public Citizen, where he founded the Consumer Justice Project, and in 2010, he argued AT&T Mobility versus Concepcion a landmark arbitration case and has since played a leading role in the debate over forced arbitration. Mr. Gupta earned his Bachelor's of Arts at Fordham University and his law degree at George University, Georgetown University Law Center. Welcome. Our second witness is Kevin Zoiber, a Lieutenant Commander in the U.S. Navy Reserves, where he has served since 2008 and was deployed in Afghanistan in 2012 for 12 months. As Lieutenant Commander, Mr. Zoiber is responsible for the manning, training, and mobilization readiness of a 130-member information warfare unit. Since 2016, Mr. Zoiber has been a fierce advocate for stronger employment and reemployment rights for National Guard and Reserve members under the Uniformed Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act, USERRA. Mr. Zoiber earned his Bachelor of Science degree in Business and Finance from the University of Southern California's Marshall School of Business. Welcome. Our third witness is Gretchen Carlson, an acclaimed journalist, best-selling author, filmmaker, and advocate. 
Ms. Carlson hosted The Real Story and co-hosted Fox and Friends for more than seven years on Fox News. In 2016, Ms. Carlson was forced out of Fox after her workplace harassment complaint became public and has since focused her energy on advocating for important legislative changes to protect sexual assault and sexual harassment survivors. She has written two New York Times bestsellers and has been recognized by the New York Women in Communication, the National Organization for Women, and the YWCA of Greater Los Angeles for her advocacy work. In 1989, Ms. Carlson became the first classical violinist to be crowned Miss America and is the first former Miss America to serve as chair of the organization. She received her Bachelor of Arts at Stanford University and serves as a national trustee for the March of Dimes. Welcome. The fourth witness on our panel is Phil Goldberg, managing partner at Shook, Hardy & Bacon, LLP. As co-chair of Shook Public Policy Group, Mr. Goldberg has more than 25 years of experiencing addressing liability-related public policy and public affairs issues. His specialty is tort and product liability theories and defenses, and he regularly speaks at judicial and attorney conferences regarding liability issues. Mr. Goldberg has filed amicus briefs with the Supreme Court, the U.S. Court of Appeals, and state courts at every level, and his scholarship has been cited by the Supreme Courts of New Jersey and Rhode Island. He was admitted to the American Law Institute in 2001, and in 2019 was named Special Counsel to the Manufacturers Accountability Project. He received his Bachelor of Arts from Tufts University and his law degree from the George Washington University School of Law. Welcome, Mr. Goldberg. Our fifth witness is Andrew Pincus. Mr. Pincus is a partner at Mayor Brown LLP with a focus on briefing and arguing cases before the Supreme Court and other appellate courts. He has argued 29 Supreme Court cases and has been the co-director of the Yale Law School Supreme Court Clinic since 2006, providing pro bono representation in 10 to 15 Supreme Court cases each year. Prior to joining Mayor Brown, Mr. Pincus served as General Counsel of the United States Department of Commerce from 1997 to 2000 and as an assistant to the Solicitor General to the Department of Justice from 1984 to 1988. He received his Bachelor of Arts degree from Yale University and his JD from the Columbia University School of Law. Welcome, Mr. Pincus. Our final witness is Professor Miriam Gillis, who has been the Paul Verkiel Chair in Public Law and at the Benjamin Cardozo School of Law since 2003. Before being appointed to this chair, Ms. Gillis served as an associate professor and lecturer of law at the Benjamin Cardozo School. She has taught courses on civil procedure, products liability, complex litigation, and contracts. Additionally, Ms. Gillis sits on the boards of both the Justice Resource Center and Public Justice, where she is an executive committee member of the Class Action Preservation Project. She received her Bachelor of Arts at the Harvard College and her law degree from Yale Law School. Welcome, Ms. Gillis. We welcome all of our very distinguished witnesses and thank them for participating in today's hearing. Now, if you would please rise, I will begin by swearing you in. Do you swear, you have to please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and beliefs to help you, God? Let the record show that the witnesses answered the affirmative, in the affirmative, thank you, and you may be seated. Uh, and to the witnesses, please know that each of your written statements will be entered into the record in their entirety. Accordingly, we ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes to help you stay within this time. There's a timing light on your table. When the light switches from green to yellow, you have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns to red, it signals that your five minutes has expired. And we'll begin with Mr. Gupta. Thank you, Chairman Cicilline, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to testify and, and for holding this hearing. Uh, as an advocate who has argued cases about forced arbitration before the U.S. Supreme Court, one thing has become clear to me, and that is that only Congress can solve this problem. Uh, I have just a few basic points this morning. First, forced arbitration is unavoidable and deeply unpopular. It's everywhere. You can't avoid it. Not if you want to live in modern society. Not if you want a mobile phone or a credit card or a bank account. And increasingly, you can't get a job unless you give up your right to hold your employer publicly accountable for sexual harassment or assault, for discrimination or wage theft. It's stressful enough for a family to check a loved one into a nursing home. Now you also have to check your legal rights at the door. A case in point involves Irene Morissette, an 87-year-old Catholic nun suffering from dementia who was raped in an assistant living facility in Alabama. After the facility failed to call the authorities, she was assaulted again. When Sister Irene's family filed a lawsuit against the nursing home, it invoked a forced arbitration clause and her case was dismissed. 
90% of nursing home chains across the country have forced arbitration clauses in their contracts. This means not only that families like Sister Irene's get denied justice, it means that patterns of wrongdoing don't come to light because arbitration mandates secrecy. Americans hate forced arbitration. In our hyper-partisan times, that, that opposition is remarkably bipartisan. 80% or more of Republicans, Democrats, and independents support legislation to end forced arbitration. People might not understand all of the technical legal details, but they know when the system has been rigged against them. That's why there's a movement afoot. It's why we saw Google workers around the world walk out, outraged at how these clauses shield sexual harassment. One of the walkout organizers, Tanuja Gupta, is here today. And it's why law students, like Harvard stu student Molly Coleman, who is also here, are organizing to get law firms to drop these clauses. The second point I want to make this morning is that forced arbitration is a fundamental threat to our democracy and to our shared constitutional values. As the Supreme Court has acknowledged, an arbitration clause often means that you'll have no way of getting justice under federal laws that would otherwise have been enforceable in court. If Congress passes laws that can't be enforced in the real world, what good are those laws? What forced arbitration really does is it replaces the laws that are written by Congress with private legislation written by corporations into the fine print of contracts that nobody reads and that nobody can negotiate. That is not what's supposed to happen in a democracy. Forced arbitration also robs us of our constitutional right to a jury trial. And this is no technicality. The very reason we have a Bill of Rights at all is because the original Constitution lacked a right to a civil jury trial. Please take a moment to appreciate how far this takes us away from our founding ideals. John Adams once said that representative government and trial by jury are the heart and lungs of liberty. Without them, he said, we have no other fortification against being ridden like horses, fleeced like sheep, worked like cattle, and fed, fed and clothed like swine and hounds. He might have been talking about forced arbitration. Third. The biggest problem with forced arbitration isn't simply that it is a biased or unfair process, it's that it kills people's claims entirely. If you remember only one thing from my testimony, I hope it's this. Forced arbitration does not do what its proponents say it does. It does not channel claims into some alternative system that is better, faster, or cheaper at resolving disputes. Instead, it makes sure that most consumers' and workers' claims simply disappear. And one way to see this is to ask what consumers actually get out of arbitration. Of the hundreds of millions of consumers that interact with banks and other financial companies, how many do you think won affirmative relief on claims of $1,000 or less in arbitration? In a two-year period for the nation's leading arbitration forum, that number was just four. Not four million, not 400,000, not even 400, just four. Contrast that with the tens of millions of consumers who received more than $2 billion in cash relief through the litigation system. These numbers expose the arguments on the other side as a bad joke. Based on this kind of comparison, we can recognize our forced arbitration for what it is, a mechanism that quietly transfers giant amounts of wealth from poor to rich. Thank you. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Mr. Zerber for five minutes. Chairman Cicilline. Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and other distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm a Lieutenant Commander in the Navy Reserves and a federal employee, but I'm here in my private capacity to share my own story as a reservist who was fired on the eve of my deployment to Afghanistan and later forced to arbitrate my discrimination claim when I returned home. I'm here to speak for tens of millions of workers who have been forced to agree to arbitration as a condition of employment. And I'm here asking this Congress to pass legislation to help give all workers a real choice to enforce their rights in court or in arbitration. Forced arbitration takes away the rights of all Americans, women and men, people with disabilities, veterans, consumers, Republicans, Democrats, and independents. As a registered Republican for most of my life, I hope both parties will work together to restore the legal rights of all Americans, which are often eviscerated by forced arbitration agreements. I'm very grateful to you, Chairman Cicilline, for your leadership in holding this hearing and your efforts to protect service members from forced arbitration.
Your bill, the Justice for Service Members Act, would simply clarify that service members cannot be, re be required to arbitrate their employment claims under USERRA, the federal law that guarantees civilian employees can take military leave and later return to their jobs. I also want to thank Chairman Nadler for his leadership with the Restoring Justice for Workers Act and Congressman Johnson for, you, for sponsoring the FAIR Act and other members of this committee for your support with these important bills. In 2008, I joined the Navy Reserves to fulfill my lifelong dream of serving my country. One challenge all reservists face is balancing their military and civilian careers, as many members of Congress know personally. Unfortunately, I learned the hard way that some employers do not support their reservist employees. In July 2010, I was hired by BLB Resources, a federal contractor in Irvine, California. I worked hard helping BLB grow from a staff of 18 to over 90 employees. Six months into my tenure, BLB asked me and other employees to sign an arbitration agreement as a condition of keeping our jobs. Like other employees who needed their jobs to make ends meet, I felt that I had no choice but to sign. In November 2012, I received orders to deploy to Afghanistan for 12 months. On my last day of work, my colleagues greeted me with a standing ovation. My office was decorated with camouflage netting and navy colored balloons. Cards and gifts were stacked on my desk. At noon, BLB held a surprise party in my honor, where 40 coworkers gathered to wish me well on my deployment. There was even a large cake with an American flag decorated in red, white, and blue with the inscription, best wishes, Kevin. Around 4.45 that same afternoon, I was called into a meeting in the HR department where I was fired and told my position would not be available to me after my deployment. The shock of being terminated on the eve of my deployment to a combat zone created an unimaginable amount of concern and anxiety about how I would support myself and my family when I returned home. That is exactly why Congress enacted USERRA, so that no service member who was asked to leave their job to fight for our country would ever have to worry about fighting for their job when they returned home. When my deployment ended in 2014, I tried to enforce my USERRA rights in federal court but BLB moved to compel arbitration and the district judge told me I had to arbitrate my case. The Ninth Circuit later upheld that ruling because it felt that USERRA's text was not clear enough in banning forced arbitration. Thankfully, my story did not end there. In 2017, when I asked the Supreme Court to hear my case, 20 members of Congress from both parties filed an amicus brief asking the court to uphold Congress's intent that USERRA bars forced arbitration. Although the Supreme Court declined to hear my case, bipartisan members of Congress have expressed support for legislation to end forced arbitration for service members and veterans in cases like mine. I hope that this Congress will act to protect service members, veterans, and all Americans from forced arbitration. Arbitration takes away so many rights that make our legal system fair. The right to an impartial judge and jury, a public and transparent forum, fair and consistent procedural rules, and a meaningful right to appeal. For me, the choice is easy. I prefer my day in court. Others may prefer arbitration, but we all should get to make this choice freely and only after a dispute has occurred. As a service member, I try to remember that our service is not for ourselves, but for every American. And in my view, no American should be denied the choice to enforce their rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'll turn to Gretchen Carlson for five minutes. Hey, thank you for having me here today. On July 6, 2016, my story about sexual harassment and Fox News chairman and CEO Roger Ailes became public. It ran like wildfire across the Twitter feeds and across media around the world. Back then, I could have never known or could have ever imagined that I would become one of the prominent faces fighting against forced arbitration, or that in the two and a half years since my case, a tidal wave of women have joined me in courageously speaking out about workplace harassment. But here's what I found out during that time, that courage is contagious, and the cultural revolution that we're experiencing right now is long overdue. The first step for me was telling the truth. The next step was to work to change the system. 
for all women and men across our country. So I spent much of 2017, 18, and now 19 walking the halls of Congress, encouraging legislators to take real, meaningful action to help workplace harassment victims. In December 2017, I proudly joined legislators from both sides of the aisle, Congresswoman Bustos and Stefanik, Senators Gillibrand and Graham, to introduce in both chambers the Ending Forced Arbitration of Sexual Harassment Act. And on February 28th of this year, with a new Congress, the bill was reintroduced in the House, H.R. 1443, a bill to restore workplace harassment victims' constitutional Seventh Amendment right to a jury trial instead of the secrecy of forced arbitration. So why is this bill so important to me? Because it's not about me. It's about the thousands and thousands of women across this country who reached out to me after my story became public, making me realize that almost every woman in this country has a story. Over the past two and a half years, these women have shared their pain and their humiliation with me. And what is the number one thing that they tell me? That they have been mostly silenced because that's what forced arbitration helps to do. And it turns out that silencing all of these women in our country ends up being the harasser's best friend. Hypothetically, here's what happens to a woman being harassed on the job when she finally decides to muster up the courage to come forward. She goes to HR to complain, and if she has an arbitration clause, and she likely does, the HR rep may do this. Whew. No one will ever know about this. Her case is promptly thrown into the secret chamber. In arbitration, she'll find out there are no limits on, or there are limits on discovery, the evidence gathering, limits on witnesses, there are no appeals. In many cases, the company even picks the arbitrator for you. It's called repeat business. In the process, she'll probably be blacklisted, demoted, and fired from her job. She may get a paltry settlement, but our woman will probably never work again. No one else at her place of employment will know what happened to her. And worst of all, the perpetrator gets to stay on the job because nobody knows about it. The whole process is secret, and that person is free to harass again and again. And I ask you today, what is fair about that? Sadly, that hypothetical story is not unique. For years, this happened at American Apparel. The chairman there was finally thrown out, the president of the company, but they all had arbitration clauses. Same thing with 180 women who've reported being sexually assaulted at a company called Massage Envy. You heard about Sterling Jewelers earlier from the chair. So none of us expect to start a new job and get into any kind of dispute like this. I know I didn't. So many Americans, they sign these forced arbitration agreements, they don't even know what they're signing or what the ramifications are with regard to their constitutional rights. But to be silenced after simply having the guts to come forward that is unjust, that is un-American. Now we're seeing the effects of people saying enough is enough. After we introduced our bill in 2017, Microsoft decided to take arbitration clauses out of their employment contracts, then Uber, Lyft, then after the Google walkout, Google, eBay, Airbnb, Facebook, Vox Media, etc. So it turns out that courage is not only contagious, so is action and the voices of workers across this country. So now it's time for us, in a bipartisan way, to come together and stop the silence. Let's do something together as a nation for our women, our men, and our children. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carlson. The chair now recognizes Mr. Goldberg for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Cicilline, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, members of the committee. Um, thank you for your invitation uh, for allowing me to testify here today. It's a particular honor for me to be here uh, and before this committee. Uh, 20 years ago, I worked for a member, uh, Steve Rothman, uh, who served on this committee, and I hold this committee in incredibly high regard as I do the civil justice system. I'm now a partner at the law firm of Shook, Hardy & Bacon and a member uh, of the American Law Institute. Uh, 
And since 2015, I have been the director of the Progressive Policy Institute Center for Civil Justice. At PPI, we believe that the civil justice system is a public good. It is a keystone of American economic and political liberties because it is a forum where aggrieved individuals and businesses can peacefully resolve disputes. But unfortunately, we also recognize that it has its limitations and that it can be abused. And as is customary, I, today, uh, the views I express are my own. A major reason why pre-dispute arbitration agreements are common today is because they provide these goals of peaceful, quick, and conclusive dispute resolution, often better than the civil justice system for many claims. You know, it didn't escape me that the title for this hearing is about the erosion of the civil justice system. And Mr. Chairman, the frustration has been that the civil justice system has been eroding for several decades. It has become more expensive. It has become less responsive to real people in many cases. And pre-dispute arbitration agreements are increasingly filling those voids because it provides real people the ability to obtain meaningful redress, particularly with modest claims that are below the threshold for which someone can get a lawyer, or where relationships are at stake, that they want to maintain those relationships after the dispute is resolved. Overall, people have found pre-dispute arbitration agreements more efficient because they have streamlined rules and less formal. They're less costly. The defendant often pays the costs and, and attorney's fees in many situations. Timely, you can get resolution in months rather than years. It's less adversarial than civil litigation. And the results, they're not all or nothing like civil litigation, but they focus on what's fair. And the Supreme Court has said the process must be reasonable and fair. And trust me, courts will throw out unconscionable pre-dispute arbitration agreements. For some, ag agreeing ahead of time to avoid the high costs and the high stakes of prolonged litigation can make the difference in the choice to pursue justice. Otherwise, those injuries will go uncompensated and unaddressed, and the defendant will be held unaccountable. This is particularly important in modest consumer employment and business disputes. If it's just you as an individual, and you have one of these more modest claims, there's no access to justice. Lawyers now generally do not take cases that are, have, have a value under $100,000, and the Minnesota Task Force recently concluded it's closer to $200,000. And if the claim is below this threshold, a pre-dispute arbitration agreement is the only chance at redemption. Sometimes disputes can be brought as class, act, class actions, but as this committee has heard time again, the class actions are notoriously bad at real redress for real people in these types of claims. The resolutions, particularly in these areas, focus on lawyers' fees, coupon settlements where you have to buy more of the defendant's products, side prey awards to third parties of which the victims get nothing, and redemption rates are anemic, not surprisingly, generally between one and four percent of people participate when they're in a class. A lot of class action settlements, real people get nothing or they get practically nothing. And the latest abuse is this no injury litigation where you have lawyers sort of dreaming up by speculative ideas on how to sue companies and there's no plaintiffs that are actually aggrieved. Pre-dispute arbitration agreements are also important where relationships matter. Litigation is highly contentious and expensive and for many people it is completely undesirable. There, you have the risk of ruining important relationships, not just with the defendant, but with colleagues, business partners, and customers, even when a company takes significant measures to protect employees from retaliation. So if you believe your benefits were wrongly calculated or you were unfairly denied a promotion or a raise, um, what does the average worker do if they want to stay at that company? If they don't have a pre-dispute arbitration agreement and they're scared off by the civil litigation system, then that's not good for anybody. It's not good for the companies who want to provide their employees with a good, safe place to go to work, and it's not good for the employees who just want to put in an honest day's work and be able to go home and spend time with their families. Finally, litigation has become subject to too much abuse. It is no longer providing plaintiffs and defendants with access to justice. Discovery battles are incredibly expensive. Lawyers are skilled at inflaming juries and escalating awards and exploiting weaknesses in the civil justice system. And plaintiffs, who even when they can hire an award, often lose half to the contingency fee and to expenses. It is not surprising that both claimants and defendants find value in an alternative system that focuses on getting aggrieved individuals fairly compensated and not paying lawyers. But these benefits cannot be achieved unless they're agreed to beforehand. Because once a dispute arises, all that gets thrown out the door. For many people, Mr. Chairman, pre-dispute pre -dispute arbitration agreements are the only path for obtaining redress. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Goldberg. The chair now recognizes Mr. Pincus for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Cicilline, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and members of the subcommittee. It's an honor to appear before you today to present the views of the U.S. Chamber Institute of Legal Reform. ILR strongly supports arbitration as a fair, less complex, and lower cost alternative to our overburdened court system. First, consumers and employees do as well or better in arbitration as in litigation. A just released study commissioned by ILR compared the results of employment claims that were arbitrated and employment claims that were litigated in federal court. It found that the overwhelming majority, around 75% of the employment cases are settled in both arbitration and litigation. No surprise to lawyers that most cases settle. But for the cases that were decided either by the arbitrator or by the court, employee plaintiffs won three times as often in arbitration compared to wins in court, 32% compared to 11%. Employee plaintiffs also recovered much larger amounts in arbitration than in court. The median award in arbitration was around $114,000 compared to around $52,000 in court. And the mean award was $520,000 in arbitration compared to around $270,000 in court. These results are consistent with the findings of numerous other studies. Second, arbitration is fair. The nation's largest arbitration providers, the AAA and JAMS, accept cases only when the governing arbitration agreement satisfies basic fairness standards regarding the selection of arbitrators, minimal costs for claimants, and the availability of discovery. In addition, and I cite these cases in my written testimony, courts can and do invalidate arbitration agreements that specify unfair procedures, such as unreasonable limits on discovery, unfair procedures for selecting arbitrators, excessive arbitration fees, requirements that arbitration take place in inconvenient locations, and loser plays provisions. Third, arbitration procedures are much simpler than complex rules that apply in court. A claimant need not ever make a personal appearance to secure a judgment. Consumer claims in particular often can be and are adjudicated based solely on written submissions or on a telephone conference if the consumer chooses to proceed that way. And the simpler procedures can be navigated by an individual with much less legal assistance and therefore lower legal fees or even without a lawyer. That flexibility and lower cost empowers consumers and employees, enabling them to obtain redress for small claims that could not practically be brought in court because of the inability to attract a lawyer. And I think, as everyone knows, to proceed in court without a lawyer makes no sense and is very unlikely to result in anything, uh, any recovery. Fourth, arbitration cannot be used to conceal wrongdoing. Claimants in arbitration are free to discuss their claims publicly and to report alleged wrongdoing to law enforcement officials. If an arbitration agreement purported to prevent the claimant from publicly disclosing his claim or misconduct or from reporting that misconduct to law enforcement authorities, that restriction would be invalidated in court and courts have invalidated those provisions. The same is true of arbitrators' decisions. Indeed, state laws require disclosure of arbitration outcomes by arbitral forums such as the AAA, and courts consistently hold that the results of arbitration proceedings may be disclosed by either party. Fifth, critics complain that arbitration agreements require resolution of disputes on an individual basis and preclude class action lawsuits. But most claims that are asserted by consumers and employees are individualized and can't be brought as class actions. And the reality is, when class actions are filed, they rarely provide benefits to class members. The CFPB's own study found that 87% of the class actions studied provided no benefits whatsoever, and that the remainder benefited, on average, only 4% of class members. Finally, as Justice Kagan recognized in her dissenting opinion in the American Express case, non-class action options abound for vindicating small injuries through arbitration. In sum, arbitration provides significant benefits to claimants as well as companies, and courts have the tools needed to provide, prevent abuses of the arbitration process. For that reason, ILR believes that no legislation eliminating arbitration or restricting pre-dispute arbitration provisions is necessary and would harm consumers, employees, and businesses. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Pincus. The chair now recognizes Ms. Gillis for five minutes. Thank you. Um, Microphone. Uh, Chairman Cicilline, uh, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you so much for inviting me here. It's a privilege to be before you. Uh, and in my few minutes, I'd just like to explain 
how forced arbitration systematically strips us of our legal rights. Um, forced arbitration clauses are everywhere. Uh, these provisions are buried in the boilerplate of take it or leave it consumer and employment contracts, and they require that all legal claims be resolved in private one-on-one -on -one arbitrations. But what this really means is that, for example, uh, if an employer rips off a group of employees, they can't sue that employer. They can't sue them in court. They can't bring a group action. They can't bring a group action in arbitration. The only thing a given employee could do in that scenario is to take on all the burden and cost of going against the employer in a one-on-one -on -one arbitration. But if an individual employee only has, say, $500 at stake, right, that's the amount that the employer ripped off, that's the amount of wage theft that we're talking about, she's not going to spend many times that amount in order to bring a claim. The, the, the game isn't worth the candle. So nearly all claims like this where forced arbitration is in effect, the employee rationally abandons her claim. And that means that the employer has basically drafted for itself what uh, Congressman Nadler described as a get out of jail free card. There's no accountability, no liability. Given that reality, I think it's not surprising that forced arbitration is so popular that over the past decade, <clears throat> It's almost impossible to find a product, a service, an amenity of modern life that doesn't require us to sign away our rights. Over 60 million American workers are subject to forced arbitration. That's more than half the non-unionized workforce. The Economic Policy Institute predicts that in three to five years, 80% of all workers will be bound by forced arbitration. I want that to sink in for just a moment. 80% of workers are gonna have to sign away their rights to have a fair workplace before they can even get a job. It just seems crazy. In consumer transactions, 86% of student borrowers, 90% of the nation's credit card debt, 88% of mobile wireless providers, 99% of payday lenders. And this is happening, and it's happening everywhere. Probably every single person in this room, and certainly every person in this country, is subject to a forced arbitration clause in some aspect of their lives to apply for a job, get a credit card, get a checking account, get a loan, belong to a gym, send your kid to a camp or put your parent in a nursing home, you have to sign away your rights. Take, for example, Richard Hedgens, my fellow New Yorker who is here in the gallery today. Richard worked for a Chipotle restaurant in 2015. Uh, he tried to join a lawsuit brought by a group of Chipotle employees against the company for wage theft. But the problem was Richard had unknowingly agreed to a forced arbitration clause. And I'm using the air quotes because the clause was buried in the fine print of an online welcome packet that Chipotle emailed to all of its new employees, requiring them to click agree before they could start work. You didn't have to actually read the documents to click agree, and we've all been on those online sites, right? So, so we can relate. Richard didn't, didn't read the, the ARB clause, but that didn't matter. His case was kicked out of court and sent into individual arbitration. Now, what Chipotle was really banking on here was that Richard and the other employees, once blocked from going to court as a collective, would just drop their claims because that's what typically happens. Again, it's usually not worth it for an individual employee to bring the claim, but that's not what happened here. The lawyers who are representing Richard and the other employees that had been pickpocketed by Chipotle they call the Chipotle's bluff, and they started to bring serial uh, arbitrations, over a thousand arbitrations. Um, and do you know what Chipotle did? They cried uncle. They went back to federal court and said, please help us out of this mess. And what's the mess? The mess is actually having to defend itself against allegations of wage theft by their own employees. I think it's pretty clear, this example, that Chipotle's plan all along was to avoid any accountability to its workers. It was trying to use its forced arbitration clause as a shield, and it just couldn't believe it when it didn't work. Um, but Richard's case is an exception, because actually I think that lots of, uh, lots of companies use forced arbitration in this way and are able to suppress claims by using forced arbitration in this way. This is just really not the way the civil justice system is supposed to work. This is not what I teach my students. This is not how it's supposed to go. Um, and so I do think that it is time for Congress uh, to act. Uh, last month in the most recent con uh, contested decision by the Supreme Court on forced arbitration, Justice Ginsburg issued a clarion call to the Congress. Uh, she told you it's urgent that Congress act to protect the rights of employees and consumers, and I really hope you do. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Gilson. Thank you to all of our witnesses for your testimony. We'll now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions. I'll begin with the gentleman from New York, the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Nadler, is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Professor Gillies, Congress has enacted laws to protect American workers from discrimination, wage theft, and uh, unsafe workplaces. But these laws are ultimately meaningless if employers are able to sidestep accountability for breaking these laws by funneling workers into an arbitration trap that is expensive, time-consuming, and secretive. What effect has forced arbitration had on the ability of workers to protect their rights to a safe workplace, to fair wages, and to be free from discrimination in the workplace? I think you've already heard a bit from uh, Ms. Carlson uh, and the other witnesses. Uh, forced arbitration disables the right of employees to be able to bring claims, to bring group claims in particular. Um, as Mr. Deepak says, it, it, it obscures patterns of misconduct, systemat systematic wrongdoing like sex discrimination that could be systematic in a workplace, uh, because these are group claims, right? I mean, when you all enact laws to protect American citizens, uh, many times you, act, you enact private rights of action, and you expect and uh, imagine that these laws will be enforced through class actions, through collective litigation. And I realize that it's the job of Mr. Pincus and Mr. Goldberg to talk about how class actions are terrible for everyone. I mean, that's, that's, that's what they're paid to do. But the truth is actually quite far from that. Class actions desegregated schools in America. They improved nursing homes in America. They've made life fair and equal for America. I, I'm here probably because of a class action that was brought at some point. So this idea that people don't benefit, I think that's pretty ridiculous. And I think um, when Mr. Pincus and Mr. Goldberg talk about benefits from class actions, they're talking about dollars that end up in people's wallets. Um, and it's true that the system might not be the most efficient way of getting dollars into consumers' pockets. Um, and maybe we should fix the system. Doesn't mean we should abandon the entire civil justice system. Thank you. And some commentators have suggested that arbitration can facilitate a quicker and cheaper resolution of disputes than through the courts. What's your response? Well, take a look at Richard's example. I mean, it, it certainly didn't help him get a quicker uh, result. The whole point of Chipotle's arbitration clause was that it would never have to be accountable. Uh, to its workers. So I don't think, I don't buy the quicker, cheaper, faster, easier. I think it's good for the employer. It's good for the company. I think it's terrible for the consumer, um, period. And uh, Mr. Gupta, you described forced arbitration as a wealth transfer. How does arbitration contribute to economic inequality? Well, it's not the, you know, the only cause of economic inequality, right? Economic inequality is probably the, the big problem of our times, but it makes it a lot worse. And, and, and the way it does that is that it, it prevents, in, the, in, the, in cases where people have small amounts of money that they're ripped off of in large numbers, um, the only way meaningfully that you're going to get redress is through some sort of group litigation, right? A class action, a collective action, a mass action. As Professor Gillis explained, there's no way that a single worker is going to be able to, to go up against the company for those kinds of claims. So when you look at wage theft, which transfers billions of dollars from workers to employers, when you look at antitrust, when you look at uh, consumer protection violations involving banks or lenders, the kinds of practices that brought down our economy and led to the financial crisis, those are the kinds of situations where you've got to have some ability for people to band together and assert their legal rights. And if you, if you cut off that avenue, which is what forced arbitration, in my view, is principally designed to do, that's going to result in a massive transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich, and that's exactly what we see happening. Thank you. It also results in, uh, in an unsafe condition which may have an arbitration award against the company being kept secret so they can keep repeating that unsafe condition all the time. Uh, let me ask, uh, some people have said that uh, uh, Italian colors demonstrates how forced arbitration and the failure to enforce antitrust laws hurts small businesses. Can you explain the importance of maintaining private antitrust suits to the enforcement of the antitrust laws? And has the court decision in Italian colors made it more likely that companies will be able to evade antitrust litigation through forced arbitration clauses? Sure. Yeah, thank you for the, the question, Chairman Nadler. I represented the restaurant in that case, Italian colors. It was an antitrust case that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Italian colors was, like many restaurants, 
you know, they deal with these credit card swipe fees, it eats a lot out of their profits, and they don't have much bargaining power when it comes to dealing with the credit card companies. And so they asserted that the credit card company, in that case American Express, was abusing its market power um, against small merchants. And all they wanted was their day in court to be able to prove that kind of claim. Now, a, a small restaurant like Italian Colors is not going to be able to, to bring an antitrust suit on its own. That requires hiring economists, studying the marketplace, and figuring out whether there's an abusive market power. So the way meaningfully that a claim that, like that has to be brought is, again, for people to be able to band together and assert their claim. And the case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And you know, I think if the, if the members of this committee are going to read one decision of the US Supreme Court on this issue, you should read Justice Kagan's dissent in that case. She puts it better than, than I possibly could. She says that the court isn't even hiding the fact that they're taking this one federal law, the antitrust law, and they're taking another federal law, the Federal Arbitration Act, that it was supposed to ostensibly facilitate dispute resolution. They're putting the two laws together, and in some strange act of judicial alchemy, people cannot resolve disputes under the antitrust clause. The, the, the cases just go away because it's not feasible to assert the, the dispute in one-on-one -on -one arbitration. And, and what Justice Kagan says is that you know, the, the majority of the Supreme Court's response is too darn bad. That is not an acceptable response, and I think that's why Congress needs to step in. Thank you. My time has expired. Thank you. Uh, I now recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Sensen, right for five. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a couple of questions for Mr. Pincus. Uh, first of all, you've testified that in arbitration, consumer and employee claimants actually do well or better than they do in court. Can you provide more detail on that? Certainly. And I, and I think there's one, one sort of idea being propagated here is that uh, if a claim goes into arbitration, somehow it either disappears or the company automatically wins. As, as the uh, study of employment claims that I referenced in my uh, opening remarks shows, employees do better in arbitration than they do in court, and they win a substantial number of cases. Another study of nursing home claims found that uh, in nursing home claims, the average Again, comparing claims in arbitration, claims in court, the average recovery was only $3,000 apart. There are numerous other studies that I've detailed in my uh, prepared testimony that show when you compare like claims in arbitration to like claims in court, arbitration claimants do as well or better. Okay. You also have suggested that consumers and employees need access to arbitration because too many of their claims cannot practically be brought in court, and that's largely because the amount in dispute is relatively low. And can you explain that in more detail? Certainly. As, as Mr. Goldberg mentioned, studies show that to get a lawyer, a claim has to be substantial. There's a debate, 60000 maybe $200,000 at issue. Most claims that real people have don't rise to that level. So. If court is the only option for them and they can't get a lawyer, they're not going to have any way to recover. So the question is, what do you do in that situation? Arbitration provides a viable option where, A, the lawyer may be willing to take the claim for less because the, the time that's going to take is less because arbitration takes less time and less lawyer time, or B, in many situations, the employee or the consumer can push the claim on her, her, his or her own. Uh, arbitration doesn't have the complicated rules in court that you need a lawyer to, to navigate. It's informal. You can file your complaint online in a very user-friendly way. The arbitrator sets the procedures that work for the particular case. So for these large number of cases that we don't see in court at all because they're too small ever to get there, arbitration provides access to justice. And there's a reason why we don't see a lot of decided arbitration claims or even filed arbitrations, because in most cases, most arbitration provisions uh, have a mediation process. Bring the claim to the company first for 30 days and see if it can be resolved. Many, many, many claims are resolved, thousands if not hundreds of thousands, in that process, because arbitration provides leverage for the employee or the consumer because when the arbitration claim is filed, 
there are limits on the fees that the consumer or the employee has to pay in these large arbitration forms that handle most arbitrations, $300 or $200. Upon filing, the employer, the employer or the company, if it's a consumer dispute, has to pay more than $1,000. So depending on what the amount in dispute is, it's pretty sensible for the company, unless it's a totally frivolous claim, to say, we're going to make you whole because if you file your arbitration claim, we're going to pay $1,000 right away and even more later on. So that gives the claimant significant leverage. Uh, final question is, if you, you have litigated before the Supreme Court a number of cases about arbitration. Based on your experience and review of the case law, would you say that the court appreciates the importance of having the arbitration system available so that the courts will do less work? I, I think courts are worried about overcrowding, but I think they're also worried uh, about we were, what we were just discussing, that there are some claims that, as a practical matter, people can't vindicate in court. And uh, you quoted Justice Breyer speaking for the court in the Allied Bruce case. There are other instances in which justices have pointed out that arbitration is cheaper, less complex, and quicker, and enables uh, small claims to be vindicated in a way that they can't be vindicated in court. And the Supreme Court has also said, uh, the Chief Justice is speaking for the court in particular, that if arbitration provisions have unfair clauses, the general rules about unconscionability that apply to contracts of adhesion will invalidate those provisions, the kinds of provisions that I listed in my opening uh, remarks. Thank you very much. My time's up. I thank the gentleman. I now recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, thank you for the witnesses being here. Thank you for your testimony. Mr. Zilber, thank you for your service to the nation. That must have been a heck of a day to uh, be honored by your fellow employees in such a way that you describe. My, I was touched. Uh, with that kind of celebration and seeing you off. And uh, that must have been a, a high point in your life. And then to uh, less than a few hours later, uh, to be smacked in the face with a, uh, with a bat and told that uh, when you come back, you won't have a job. Uh, and then, uh, Ms. Carlson, thank you so much for your courage and your um, sense of uh, wanting to give back to the community and give back to people, particularly women without a voice, uh, who suffer silently in the workplace, undergoing uh, what must be, um, yeah, uh, I mean, I, I have, I, I'm a man, so I don't really know what you have to put up with, but millions of women around this country having to put up with a climate and a culture of, uh, of sexual harassment uh, is, you know, my heart goes out to you, and I want to thank you so much for your courage in sticking with this. Mr. Pincus, um, is it, you, you mentioned that, um, the arbitrator uh, often sets the procedure to accommodate the needs of the parties, correct? Yes. And um, in fact, there's really no uh, requirement that the arbitrator be trained in the law. No, no, no requirement that the arbitrator be a lawyer or a judge, is that correct? I think it depends on the arbitral yeah, forum. Yeah, it depends so, on the So on the I think arbitrator. some, a lot of claims. And there, there's no requirement, though. There's cert, there is a requirement that the arbitrator be fair and that the arbitrator be capable of rendering a so fair there's, decision. There's certainly no requirement if the arbitrator gets to select the procedure that um, there's no requirement that the rules of uh, procedure apply. No requirement that there's uh, a need for the rules of evidence. Uh, to apply. No, no need for there to be an adherence to the rule of law, in other words, statutes or case law that has uh, decided similar issues. Isn't that correct? No, well, no there, requirement. There's yes no, no. Well, there's no requirement, no requirement that particular rules apply, but and there is a requirement that there be a fair opportunity to obtain discovery and that the rules applied be fair. 
But I mean, the, the arbitrator can decide whatever he or she wants uh, for a particular case. That doesn't seem uh, consistent with the rule of law. That seems to be consistent with uh, the whim of uh, whoever is in charge. And it's usually the, the, uh, the business interests that are in charge. Now, it seems to me to be counterintuitive that an employer or a nursing home operator, since you cited employment claims and nursing home claims, it would seem to be counterintuitive to me that they would prefer uh, arbitration when the studies that you cite show that uh, they lose more and uh, the claimants uh, uh, are awarded more money. Can you explain why would a employer or, or, or nursing home operator prefer um, uh, arbitration when it, it's, it, the outcomes are worse than going to court? Because the lion's share of the costs of a litigation are paying lawyers. And well, the, uh, the and, legal and most fees of are... Those, most of those lawyers are defense lawyers, are they not? Well, there are defense lawyers and there are plaintiffs' lawyers. Because, yeah, I mean, but most defense lawyers don't like arbitration because they make less money. Well, but the corporate lawyers are charging what nine hundred fifty dollars an hour these days, and um, and then the corporation that's paying them, like the NRA, gets a chance to write off the uh, expense of paying the lawyer who is a member of the same country club that they are. I mean, you know, but the poor claimant who has a $500 claim, I mean, no lawyer, most lawyers don't want to get a percentage of that, and they know that uh, it's going to take at least several hours to adjudicate the case. Um, so the $500 claimants get left out, but the $100,000, $200,000 claimants, Mr. Goldberg, there's always lawyers willing to take those cases on a contingent fee basis. Would you not agree? The gentleman's time has expired, but the witness may answer the question. Uh, yes, and I think you're pointing to the exact problem as to why pre-dispute arbitration provides a viable path for someone with the $500 claim who wouldn't be able to seek justice. What about the $100,000 or the $200,000 claim? There's always going to be some lawyers out there who'll take that for a percentage. That's right. I used to take them all the time myself as a private practitioner. That, good, good little payday, but thank you. Thank you uh, to the gentleman, and now I recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I'm still trying to get over the, uh, the ATT versus Concepcion case, uh, and, and I just want to relive um, the gruesome details of this case, uh, and I don't mean to, to cause you any nightmares, Mr. Gupta, but as I understand it, <laughs> California had a pro-arbitration state law. What it said was That's right. that you can't build into a contract a clause which forbids class-wide arbitration, right? You, you, in other words, That's right. you, all it was saying was your contracts cannot categorically block out a class-wide arbitration that was challenged in state court under state and federal constitutional laws. And in the Discover Bank case, if I remember correctly, the California Supreme Court said it was totally fine. So now we have a situation where if the businesses really love arbitration, they can have both kinds. They can have individual and they can have class-wide, but they went to court to sue against uh, California's law to get it struck down, right, as uh, preempted by the, the Arbitration Act, the Federal Arbitration Act. A massive assault on federalism and on due process rights and uh, the rights of states to decide on their own civil justice systems. And so it was found, um, it was found preempted. Why would the people who today are coming forward to say that they love arbitration and arbitration saves all this money go to the Supreme Court to get a law struck down that was protecting arbitration? Could you answer that, Mr. Good? Yeah, th thank you for the question. It, it, well, you know, so, so um, I can't go over the case either, and I, you know, um, um, my friend Andy Pincus over here, he was my opponent in the case, and I'm sure he'll have a different view, but, uh, you know, the, the, um, the, the reason um, is that the corporations are not really interested in arbitration. They're interested in claim suppression. So the, the idea of having class arbitration, the idea of allowing people to band together and bring their claim in arbitration, was the worst of 
all worlds for this company because, because suddenly consumers would be able to assert their claims and then the company would have no right of appeal and then all the things we're complaining about arbitration, the company would be complaining. In your case, the, 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 weren't people being hit up with like a $20 fee Exactly, yeah. Uh, when it they was, bought a, a cell phone. So it wouldn't make sense for anybody to spend the money to get a lawyer a couple hundred bucks or 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks to litigate over this $20 fee themselves. But if you band everybody together, there were tens or hundreds of thousands of people in California. <coughs> That's where a class-wide arbitration would make some sense. The state law tried to protect that, but the corporations came in and sued and said, we think that this violates our rights to subject us to a class-wide arbitration. Right, right. And all the state law was trying to do, this was general you know, contract law. I was surprised that Mr. Pincus mentioned unconscionability law because the whole effort in the Supreme Court has been to get rid of the traditional tools of unconscionability that police unfair contracts. All the state law was saying is, look, you have to be able, you can't have a get out of jail free card. You have to be able to let people with these kinds of small claims, as you mentioned, band together and assert their rights. And you know, when you have a $30 fee on your cell phone bill, that's sort of the prototypical example of a case for a class action. If AT&T can rip everyone off of $30 yeah. and, and people don't have the right to band together to assert those claims, they're going to get away with it and fraud will pay. So you have to have a way to allow people to band together and assert okay. these claims. I, I want to give Mr. Pincus his fair ups. I think he's my constituent and that's the only reason I'm doing it because I know <laughs> he's, got, he's got a very big platform in the world. He's a brilliant lawyer, there's no doubt, but if you could set aside all of your brilliance and your <laughs> litigious cleverness and just tell us, well, why, why would you be taking the position today that it's a good thing for everybody to have uh, arbitration and yet the whole point in the Supreme Court was to destroy a class-wide arbitration? I love Maryland, but I'm a citizen of the District of Columbia. Oh, okay. Then, uh, I, then, <laughs> then, then I mean, I'm going to use my time to talk to Ms. Carlson. Then I, yeah, I'll give you 15 seconds, but I do have a question for her. So, well, I think the critical issue in the Concepcion case was the fundamental nature of AT&T's clause. What AT&T did was to use arbitration to create an incentive for small claims to be brought. What AT&T said is, if you bring a claim. And in our pre-mediation, in our mediation process, we don't settle. And in, on the merits, you win even a penny more. You're going to get a minimum payment of $5,000. Your attorney's fees will be paid. That payment is now up to $10,000, double attorney's fees, and all your expert witness costs. Because what AT&T okay, wanted to do... Okay, I got to because I only have 10 seconds left. Okay, but I, I will go back and read the Supreme Court argument and look for an answer in there. Okay, uh, Ms. Carlson, if you could, just tell us quickly what happened to you in the arbitration process. Can you tell us? The gentleman's time has expired, but the witness may answer the question. Yes, so I never got to that point um, after my lawyers um, figured out how to make my case public um, in a different way by suing my alleged perpetrator independently and not the company. Um, but uh, for the millions of Americans, especially women, who do have arbitration clauses with regard to sexual harassment, I would just ask this committee to look at the word forced because if you actually have a choice, then why wouldn't we let the American people do that? I see, and so it just so happened that, it, forgive me, Mr. Chairman, but, but that Mr. Ailes had the independent means, you could sue him for what he had done to you, but if you, if you had somebody who wasn't a deep pocket like that and you had to sue your employer, you would have been forced into a dark room someplace where nothing would have ever come of it. And that is the whole problem with the way in which our country has chosen to deal with sexual harassment cl claims within the workplace. Because arbitration has become a tool to cover up a company's dirty laundry. Nobody will ever know about all of these women. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now recognize the gentlelady from Washington, Ms. Jayapal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I just want to say thank you to all the witnesses for being here, in particular, Ms. Carlson um, and Mr. Zyober uh, for, did I say that right? Zyober for sharing your stories and your work. Um, I have just watched this whole area with horror because it is exactly as you said, Ms. Carlson, that there are these ordinary people who are signing agreements to give up all kinds of rights um, to go to court and they don't know that they're doing so most of the time. Um, these mandatory arbitration agreements, as we know, are often buried very deep in an employee handbook somewhere, or a credit card agreement, or an app's listing of terms and conditions. It's that prevalent. And who benefits from these mandatory arbitration agreements? More often than not, it is the large and powerful corporations that put these agreements in there in the first place. 
Um, these mandatory arbitration agreements, I think, pose a very dangerous threat to almost every regular person who would like to keep their rights intact, from consumers to small businesses to nursing home residents. But for years, I've been particularly concerned about the harms that workers face with these mandatory arbitration agreements, and especially vulnerable workers. Workers of color are hampered from protecting their civil rights, even when they experience egregious racial discrimination. Survivors of sexual assault, as Ms. Carlson has been such a powerful spokesperson uh, for this issue, can't join together because mandatory arbitration allows this toxic culture of secrecy to prevail and abuse to fester, and workers are prevented from speaking up and taking collective action. So Ms. Carlson, um, I am a very proud original co-sponsor of our bipartisan, bicameral bill together to uh, end forced arbitration uh, around sexual harassment. We were able to, last session, get a number of major companies to come on board. I thank you for your courageous voice and testimony and your advocacy on that. Um, many other women from your workplace came forward with similar stories of sexual assault and mistreatment, and yet you couldn't join together with them and in fact, you can't even speak publicly about how you dealt with the mandatory arbitration clause in your contract. In your testimony, you said very powerfully, silencing women is the harasser's best friend. I was struck by that phrase. Can you explain how a mandatory arbitration agreement undermined your rights and your ability to band with other survivors and seek remedy? Uh, yes, and unfortunately because the other way in which we solve uh, harassment cases in our country is settlements with NDAs, I cannot tell you specifics about my story. Right. I can tell you hypothetically how it happens when women can't band together. Arbitration means that you have no way of knowing that anyone else is facing the same thing within the confines of the workplace structure. There's no way to know because the whole process is secret. And as I described during my testimony, if you do muster up the courage to go and complain, and you have an arbitration clause, um, that's a good day for the company because no one will ever know anything about your story. The worst ramification of all of this is that the perpetrator gets to stay in the job. And I think one of the reasons that we've seen this cultural revolution that we're experiencing right now is because the American public was actually so angry about hearing about these stories. And they were wondering, why didn't we know about this? Right. And the reason they didn't know about it is because of forced arbitration. Thank you. Um, Miss, uh, let's see, Professor Gillis. Um, Mr. Pincus claimed in his testimony that arbitration is not secretive. And I just want to give you a chance to say whether you agree with that and uh, why or why not. Uh, and so this won't surprise you, I completely disagree. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, it, Mr. Pincus is right that California, the great state of California, has enacted a statute that requires disclosure. Uh, of, of, of arbitration um, uh, outcomes. I got to say, I, I've, as a researcher, have tried to access and use that database. It's pretty bloodless. It's really hard. It's very redacted. It's very hard to get real information. And that's not what we mean, right? I mean, if a court of law were to just, you know, sort of have to tell me the name, date, um, and winner of a case, that that's not what we mean when we talk about full and fair access to justice, right? We need, and I think um, uh, Congressman Nadler said this earlier, we, we, we need to know what is going on in the court system. We need to know the types of claims that people are bringing. We need to know what systemic harms are going on in the workplace, as, as Ms. Carlson just noted. And these disclosure statutes are not enough, right? We, we really need true public access. And you said earlier also that 80%, I believe you said 80% of workers will be subjected to mandatory That's arbitration. That's what the EPI is predicting in that, three to five years. That is a stunning number. When and you think about it, though, why wouldn't they? I mean, the Supreme right. Court has just decided Epic Systems, which gives a green light to all employers, right? They're going to do it unless you stop them. Right. Well, I thank you for your testimony. And I also just want to say thank you so much to... Um, to uh, Richard Hagens for taking on mandatory arbitration at Chipotle on wage theft. Um, I also want to thank Molly Coleman for organizing law students to be aware and resist mandatory arbitration contracts. I don't know where you are, Molly, but thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just think that these efforts are so important because I don't think the majority of Americans understand how this affects their daily life, their rights, and their access to due process. Well, hopefully this hearing is going to help uh, bring that Yes, thank you for doing so this. Thank you. And I recognize the gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Armstrong. For thank you. Minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just as a preface prior to getting here, I served in the state legislature. And two things we've done over the last six years is we have raised the small claims rate continually higher and higher 
And one of the reasons for that is because just quite frankly, access to the court system is getting more and more expensive. So um, as, as, as a recovering attorney, um, I can place some blame on myself for that in my profession, but um, Mr. Goldberg, if the arbitration system's wiped out, I mean, it really only leaves litigation as any as the solution, and you've suggested that for consumers and employees, litigation has steadily become more, much more expensive. And I mean, particularly like in a state with North Dakota with really fast population growth and our court systems all across the state are overburdened, um, so less responsive over the last decades. Why is that? I think um, in large part there's certainly a lot more litigation, and as you've seen over the past 20, 30, 40 years, uh, it, litigation's just become a lot more expensive. And, it, it's a, and it's more of a, of a battle between both sides over discovery and all these things that happen, which just makes it untenable for a lot of people, both from, a, from a, their disposition, but then also from an economic perspective and the ability to actually get a fair outcome uh, for themselves. And I think the, what we're seeing in the worst aspects of this is in the class action area where you're just seeing, as I mentioned before, you're seeing these no injury cases and a bunch of class actions that have nothing to do with anybody being injured without anybody seeking being aggrieved. But it's millions of dollars that go into litigating them and paying attorney's fees and the result ends up being either a side prey award to a third party or, or a recovery that nobody really wants. And so nobody participates in it. And so that's, the, that's what's causing the, the civil justice into a road. And that's where I think the pre-dispute arbitration agreements are, are providing a viable alternative in filling that void. And you've stated, and I actually, I, I mean, I think this figure probably differs somewhat region by region, but that lawyers may not take cases unless the value is, I mean, $200,000 or higher. And I mean, so why is that, why, why do you think that figure is so high? I think because litigation has become so expensive and trial lawyers, just like anybody, want, they want to get paid for their, their work. I don't blame them for that. Um, it takes more money and more effort to engage in, in litigation these days than it used to. And so um, we're, you know, 20 years ago, that number, according to studies, used to be closer to 60,000. Now it's upwards 100 to 200,000. And so the people who fall below that line just don't have access to justice into the civil justice system when, they're, when it's a one-off case. So if we get rid of um, arbitration in, in this realm, how many consumer and employee claims are gonna be, I mean, shut out altogether if, I mean, if arbitration isn't available, at least for smaller claims? I mean, I don't have an exact number in terms of the number of claims, but most of, those, but most of the claims that would fall under those would not have access to justice. They had, you know, the pre-dispute arbitration agreement provides the only path where oftentimes the arbitration is paid for by the employer or by the, the, the company, and uh, often uh, attorney's fees are available if the, if the consumer or the employee prevail. And so it's, it's a much more cost-effective and streamlined way for them to get, to get the recovery that they are seeking. And so even if it's a $500 amount, they're gonna get to keep more of that than they would if it was in litigation. And I think you and Mr. Pincus both kind of agree on post-dispute arbitration, um, Agreements, I mean, and they, they just, what are the real world barriers to um, those, type of, those type of arrangements? Well, once the, once the dispute arises, um, agreeing to even the size of a table to sit at, let alone what path you're gonna choose, is probably gonna be a difficult endeavor. And, but more to the point, the, the incentives change. And so if it's a small dispute, if it's under that threshold we're talking about, the hundred to $200,000 threshold, the, the claimant may say, hey, I'd rather go to arbitration because that's a fair or better way for me to get justice. And then the defendant, the company may say, no, we're not going to arbitrate that claim because we don't have an event. You know, we don't have it. It's not our, it's, it's not to our, our, you know, why would, if you're not going to bring that claim by the way, why would we get, engage in that? And if, and if the claim is larger, the reverse may be true. And so the only way to really make the system work is to offer it ahead of time. And so, and make, and, and it creates a system, again, that's based on trying to get what's fair. It's not all or nothing, it's not as expensive, and it's trying to get to a result that works, that's the right result given the situation at hand. And I just, with the limited time I've left, I just point out, we've had a Bach and Shale revolution, oil boom in Western North Dakota, and one of the big issues that comes up is landowner or mineral rights versus oil company rights. And without some of the arbitration stuff that we have done at the state level, we would dramatically decrease access for farmers in the middle of Western North Dakota that just simply don't have the resources to take on 
a medium, small, or large oil company. So there are inverse situations where this is absolutely necessary. And with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. And I yield to the very distinguished gentleman from the state of Colorado, Mr. Nagus, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for testifying today, uh, in particular, Ms. Carlson and, and Mr. Zyber. Thank you for sharing your stories and for your courage. And, and certainly, we're hopeful that we can help others uh, avoid um, uh, the, the ways in which I think employers and variety of corporations have abused this system uh, of forced arbitration. It's why I'm proud to be a sponsor of uh, the FAIR Act, and I appreciate Representative Johnson and Representative uh, Cicilline and, of course, the chairman for their leadership on this front. Mr. Goldberg, I want to just touch on, uh, I have a line of questioning, but I, I could not resist the temptation of following up on my good friend and colleague, Mr. Armstrong's questions, because it sounds like, and I'll quote the words you used, or the notion that claimants who may have a claim that is smaller, relatively speaking, lower than $200,000, I think is the number that's been sort of tossed around today, that their only path, quote unquote, uh, absent forced arbitration would be arbitration. That is to say, if we get rid of the modern arbitration system, they would have no, I think in your words, access to justice. And I guess I'm confused because my understanding as a lawyer is that claimants can pursue pro se actions in court um, they are not, they would have to retain a lawyer, obviously, to the extent they'd like to retain one, they'd have to pay for one. But the same is true in the arbitration context. Is that right? So I, I'm not understanding why uh, this, this argument or this notion that they have no access to, the, to justice if uh, we remove forced arbitration as the mechanism today. You know, the, the civil litigation system is, is Pretty burdensome and onerous. And well, okay, let's talk about that. So, are often you familiar? Times you let, hold on, I'll look at my time. You're familiar with small claims court, correct? Absolutely. I happen to hail from the great state of Colorado. We have a small claims court system under $7,500. You can go into court. You can file a simple form. Yeah, I'm sure that the same holds true in the state where you practice law. Yes. About, sound about right? Yes. And you pay a small filing fee. I believe it's $31 in Colorado. Probably similar to what you pay in a small claims court in your jurisdiction. Fair. Right. And there's a mediation option, actually, in our small claims court. I don't know if that happens to be a function of your system, but it certainly is the case in Colorado. And so I, this is where I'm struggling because I understand if you want to make the case, you know, in your testimony, the first page, I'll quote, you say, a major reason that pre-dispute arbitration agreements have become more commonplace in our society is because they achieve this goal of peaceful, quick, and conclusive dispute resolution. I understand if you want to make the case that employers, corporations, businesses have concluded that, what I just described, but the notion that consumers and employees have made that judgment, I think, is, is just not the case. It is not supported by the facts, because ultimately, consumers aren't making the choice. Employees aren't making the choice, and I, I would, I mean, I hope, I would hope you'd agree, at least with respect to that quote that I just mentioned, of uh, this presupposition that somehow employees and, and consumers are the reason why these agreements are more commonplace, that that's not what you're suggesting. I think there's a large gap between the $7,500 figure that you mentioned in terms of what caps you out of the small claims court and the $100,000 to $200,000 value of a claim that re sometimes requires to get a lawyer. And pro se plaintiffs, yes, you can pursue a claim pro se, and, and, and small claims court may be a very viable opportunity for people under that threshold. But by and large, people are not going to be able to bring a claim if they're above that threshold, and they don't need a lawyer oftentimes if they're going through a small pre-dispute arbitration path either. And so it is, so it is a, um, it, it provides access to, for people above that, but below the threshold of, of where somebody might not take, where the lawyer might not take the claim, and it provides um, as good, if not well, better. I appreciate that. That's a little bit different than I, and, and maybe I just misunderstood uh, the point that you were making that Mr. Pickus were made earlier with respect to claims that are a couple of thousand dollars. But in any event, just to, uh, not to belabor the point, but is it your position that these agreements have become more commonplace because employees and consumers have made that decision? I, I, I just want to make sure I'm clear on that front. That's not your position. I actually think that, there, that, that arbitration agreements are becoming more complex and people are, more, are using it more, as we've heard from some of the but they're not, but, but, Sir, they're not using them more because they are, you're not, consumers aren't drafting these agreements. I mean, I presume you use Facebook, you, you know, go to an ATM, maybe you flew to Washington, D.C. to testify today, maybe you took an Uber or a Lyft to come to testify in front of this committee. You didn't draft any of those arbitration agreements, correct? 
correct. Yeah, the, the, the corporations did, the employers did. That's, that's my point. And so, again, I understand if you want to make the case about the values of arbitration. That's certainly your case to make. But let's not uh, engage in this intellectual fantasy that somehow consumers and employees are making the choice because anyone can pick up their phone and look up their Uber app or Lyft app or, or any other similar app and see that the terms and conditions are buried far deep within that app. And the notion that the consumers are making the choice to do so, I just think is a fallacy. The last thing I would note, Mr. Chair, because I do know that my time has expired, I, I know a number of folks have recognized the Pipeline Parity Project. We're joined today by some of the law students from that project. I appreciate their advocacy with respect to uh, having law firms remove forced arbitration clauses from their contracts. And I appreciate, Mr. Goldberg and Mr. Pincus, that both of your law firms, I understand, have abandoned forced arbitration contracts for your employees. If that's not the case, you certainly have a chance to clarify that. Uh, we never have had one. Yeah, yeah. Never had one. Well, you know, I would hope that, that, uh, that we could agree on legislation that would enable employers across the country to take that same approach, and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Um, since the Second World War, Congress has expanded and strengthened laws that guarantee every veteran and active duty service member, including those serving at the Reserves and National Guard, the right to be free from discrimination in the workplace on the basis of their military service and the right to their day in court to enforce these protections. As Mr. Zoeber has testified, these laws are meaningless if they are not enforceable through the courts. And he's not alone. The Military Coalition, which is a broad consortium of unified service and veterans organizations, representing more than five and a half million current and former service members, has referred to forced arbitration as, and I quote, an un-American system wherein service members' claims against a corporation are funneled into a rigged, secretive system in which all the rules, including the choice of the arbiter, are picked by the corporation, end quote. Our brave men and women in uniform deserve better. And that's why I've introduced the Justice for Service Members Act that Mr. Zuber made reference to that would prohibit the circumvention of their rights under laws designed to protect service members and veterans. And I'd ask you, Mr. Zuber, if, if you could just expand on what it was like and what impact it had on you as you were about to depart to a, to a war zone in defense of your country to know that you were deprived of your right to contest your firing, even though Congress had expressly provided for that protection in federal law. Mr. Chairman, first of all, I want to thank you for introducing the Justice for Service Members Act. I believe it was introduced yesterday, and thank you for your support in that endeavor. Um, so if, in my case, as I mentioned in my testimony, you know, at noon, I'm having a big party with the company, I, cards and gifts, and a lot of support. You have a sense of patriotism and, and appreciation for your service, and then at five o'clock, you're sitting there, you know, getting fired, and so you're trying to compartmentalize what just happened. You're confused, you're embarrassed, uh, you have anxiety about what your future is gonna hold. Um, I was leaving for pre-deployment training that following Monday, so my mind was set to be focused on training. Now I'm wondering how I'm gonna support myself and my family when I return home from my deployment. Um, you go do your mission, you, you, you do the best you can to support your mission and your teammates downrange. Um, that's what you're there for, to, to go do. But in the back of your mind, you know, your family back home, or if you have kids or a wife, they're thinking, how are we going to pay the mortgage when you get back? What, how are we going to provide food on the table? The kids need braces, whatever the case may be. So it's, it's not a position that service members should be put into. Um, and I would just, if I could just really quickly say, I think there's a bigger picture here, too. I mean, in my case, it, it hurt me, and I'm here to advocate to not have other service members feel the, the same type of, uh, of pain. But... I think this is a, a, a metal, um, military readiness issue. I mean, we, we draw on our reservists so much in, for strategic reserves, um, operational support nowadays. USERA is the law that lets service members go from civilian to military duty and back to civilian jobs. And the more that's weakened, I think it's gonna discourage people to really wanna step up and serve their country in that regard. And, and they bring a lot of skills, medical, aviation, engineering, that diversity is really beneficial to our country. Thank you very much and thank you for your service. Thanks. Mr. Gupta, when Congress enacted the Federal Arbitration Act in 1925, it never intended for arbitration to serve as a corporate shield against the enforcement of our laws. 
or soared to weaken protections or to protect corporate wrongdoing. Far from it, as the Supreme Court noted in 1967 in the Prima Paint decision, the legislative history of the law makes clear that Congress did not intend for parties with unequal bargaining power to be forced to arbitrate claims on a take it or leave it basis. How do you explain the Supreme Court's departure from decades of case law and the clear legislative intent of the Federal Arbitration Act and other laws that are designed to be enforced through the justice system? Is there any label for this other than judicial activism on behalf of corporate wrongdoers? I don't think there is. I think it would be hard to identify another federal statute passed by Congress where the Supreme Court has strayed so far from the original t intent of the legislation. Um, I've gone back and looked at the history of the act from 1925. It, people weren't blind to the possibility of abuse. They raised these concerns before this, this committee, in fact. And the, and the architects of the legislation were clear. This is about letting businesses of equal bar bargaining power that want to resolve their disputes out of court, letting them do that. And, and I have no objection to that. That makes perfect sense. Um, but but the, the drafters were clear this is not about um, foisting this on people who don't consent through take it or leave it contracts. And in fact, Congress put in a provision, section one of the Federal Arbitration Act, that says this shall not apply to any class of workers. Remarkably, the Supreme Court has read that language to mean precisely the opposite, and now it can apply to any class of workers. Um, and so, so we have just, we've strayed so far away from what Congress intended in 1925, and that's why only this body, Congress, can set things aright. Thank you. My very final question. It's, it's really hard to understand, Professor Gillis, what Mr. Pincus argues. This idea of people, you know, want arbitration. We know it's deeply unpopular with Republicans, Democrats, independents. So it's not a political idea. Deeply unpopular with the American people, above 80%. And obviously, if it produced better outcomes, people could voluntarily pick it. But of course, they don't. They're forced into it by the other party in the disagreement, the corporation. So is Mr. Pincus right that, that people like arbitration? They want it. They're dying to be into it. Or The numbers don't, uh, don't support Mr. Pincus at all. I mean, you know, we're all going to do some selective citing of studies, um, but, but I think mine are better. Uh, the... the um, <laughs> Uh, we, we know that, for example, only one out of every 10,400 employees ever files an arbitration claim. Um, I think that when Mr. Pincus talks about how well employees do in arbitration, he's talking about high value cases, cases that probably would have done fine in court, but for whatever reason, those employees decided maybe for the privacy, because some claims are a little bit embarrassing, to have those claims in arbitration. That's all fine. We're not talking about getting rid of arbitration altogether here, people. We're talking about making it voluntary. Right? We're talking about making it post-dispute so that they can decide. And despite what Mr. Goldberg says, I think the American people can handle that choice. I don't think it's going to create a ton of transaction costs. I think he's just worried that they won't take them up on you. Uh, they won't take you up on the offer, right? They, they would prefer to be in court. They won't, wouldn't prefer to be in court because they want their lawyers to get paid. They would prefer to be in court because that's where claims belong, in public court, not in private arbitration. So... We disagree, Mr. Pincus and I. Thank you. Thank uh, you. At this time, I now would seek unanimous consent to add a number of letters and statements to the record from organizations in support of ending forced arbitration and passing the FAIR Act. A letter in support from George Slover, a senior policy advisor with Consumer Reports. Without objection. A letter in support of legislative ending forced arbitration from Lisa Gilbert, the vice president of legislative affairs from Public Citizen. Without objection. A letter in support of the FAIR Act from Terry O'Neill, the executive director of the National Employment Lawyers Association. Without objection. A letter supporting the FAIR Act from the FAIR Arbitration Now. Without objection. And a statement from Alan Carlson, owner of Italian Colors Restaurant, supporting the FAIR Act. And one final uh, thing I'd like to do before we adjourn is just take a moment to recognize several people who have traveled from all over the country to attend today's hearing. Uh, Tanuja Gupta, who has organized and led the Googlers for Ending Forced Arbitration and Google Walkout Movements, which culminated in Google's decision to end its use of forced arbitration earlier this year. Richard Heggins, a former Chipotle employee who's also with us today. Richard was forced to work off the clock without pay by his employer. Along with several thousand other employees, Richard's attempt to hold his employer accountable for wage theft has been forced into individual arbitration. Tara Zumer, who is a former employee of WeWork, an office leasing startup, who was fired for refusing to sign a forced arbitration clause in her employment contract. Since then, she has fought for the rights of millions of workers against forced arbitration. 
Tom Troy, who was also with us. Tom is a partner at the Starbucks Coffee Company who filed an age discrimination complaint against the company and has fought to bring awareness to the public and other employees at Starbucks about the company's use of forced arbitration. And finally, Molly Coleman, who's a student at Harvard Law School who co-founded the Pipeline Parity Project, which has led a campaign to end forced arbitration at many of the biggest law firms in the world. And very finally, Emmanuel Skorsic works for Google in Mountain View. Uh, and was part of Googlers for Ending Forced Arbitration, uh, collecting, comparing, and analyzing arbitration clauses and employee contracts for companies across the tech industry. So I want to welcome you and thank you for being here. This uh, concludes today's hearing. Again, I want to thank our witnesses for their very helpful testimony. And without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional ma materials for the record. This hearing is adjourned.